Blizzard have finally apologized. Don't get too excited if you're a Warcraft fan, though. Not that. Overwatch. Yes. So the Overwatch community has been in a bit of a pickle for quite a long time. Remember a very funny tweet going around recently comparing, you know, here's how many champions Riot's oh, added. Yeah. Here's how much Valorant's got and all these different games. And Overwatch had one new hero. <laughs> so it's been rubbish for the Overwatch community. And as a bit of a TLDR, Blizzard have said that they are sorry, that they promise better communications, faster updates, that Overwatch 2 PvP is coming first, and there's no word on when PvP or PvE is coming. Yep, or where it is, or what it is. <laughs> and that just makes me think, like, what the... <laughs> yeah. What was this when you announced it? How much of this actually existed? And given how long the announcement seemed to, seemed to be, like, what's been going on? Yeah, I... I really <sighs> weird. I mean, if I had to guess, I would say it's just Blizzard perfectionism kicking in again, and they're never going to release a product unless it's perfect, and that's the problem. But I think too there is a bit of Bobby's fiddling, oh, and yeah, I think there's right, yeah. probably another issue here where, as many of us thought when we first saw it, why mm -hmm. is Overwatch 1.5 <laughs> now being billed as a as a sequel just to get another sixty buck? Yep. Why didn't you keep this running as a live game? What are you doing? Very weird. Mm -hmm. So as for how things are going in Overwatch 2, yep. well, daily playtest and feedback, uh, they say, have given us the confidence that they're creating something people are going to love. Yep. I mean, people already kind of liked Overwatch 1, so makes you wonder. Yep. Uh, at the same time, they want the game to be in people's hands, and that's why uh, they're basically making all of these announcements now, which I think basically amounts to the decoupling of PvP from PvE so that one doesn't hold the other back. I yeah. think so that Blizzard don't end up with a completely dead game community. Yeah, I mean, that's fundamentally it. It's also like they kind of uh, shot themselves in the foot by, or, you know, they've laid themselves a trap by, you know, hyping up, oh, well, uh, you know, Overwatch 2 will be, that's what the, the Isles played on this year. Like, well, that necessitates it being a game that's actually ready to play. And obviously there's all that yeah. feedback from, you know, people going, well, you can't have a game that doesn't exist to like the public and play private esports on that because that completely kills the entire scene immediately stone dead because people can't play the game they're watching you can't do that that's not how it works so there's, a, there's so many factors that are like this is the only thing that makes sense but the fact that it only makes sense now and that you're only doing it now is like who is making these decisions because what happened to them yeah, absolutely. Now, the, the the good bit of news is I remember all of the Overwatch 2 creators or yeah. Overwatch creators who got NDA to hell and then were, you know, they went to some sort of private event and they were all singing its praises, which, you know, maybe take with a pinch of salt because reality is sometimes a bit different when the thing comes out, but it is at least a good signal. Yeah, for I mean, sure. Many of them are people who felt pretty let down and disappointed for a long time themselves. After all, now, as for this apology, they've said that uh, they recognize they've not communicated well, they haven't kept people up to date, and honestly, we've let you down when it comes to delivering Overwatch content. We hear you, and we're committed to doing more continual updates uh, on all things Overwatch 2. Obviously, our big question is why. Uh, I think the deeper why of how the hell did any of this happen, <laughs> we'll get into that, but I know at least to a degree there's a bit of Bobby, yeah. there's a bit of the Overwatch League, which I've heard one or two things about, and potentially even the StarCraft Battlefield game. Oh, yes. I think yes, a lot of people right. will have forgotten about, but uh, hmm. from my sources, it does figure into this. Yep, for sure. As for the future direction, then, they've said that they've taken some time to rethink the game uh, with the singular goal of ensuring it is a living game, serving our players with exciting content on a regular basis. And because of that, they're decoupling the PvP from uh, PvE so that the come sooner. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this to me is a bit weird because ideally they would have this come out with a whole bunch of content for all the different modes and everyone would be happy. So they're having to decouple it, which means that PvE is behind. Now, yep. does this mean that when it comes, it's going to be brilliant full featured PvE, what everybody wants, or does it mean they're basically going to get the minimum releasable quantity of PvE content and then try to run that as a live service, at which point it either goes really well and there's lots of content and people are happy, or it goes more in the direction of, say, a battlefield where everyone is left scratching their heads as to where the content is. We obviously can't know at this stage. Mm. Yeah, it's it's awkward just to me how utterly, uh, what's the term, ambitious this really is. Because they're saying, you know, in terms of having PvE and PvE run, PvP run at the same time, they are basically going, we will make Rainbow Six Siege and The Division and they'll be the same game, by the way. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's why it's taken them so long to get it ready, because how do you, like, how do you do that? How do you physically do that? 
And then, of course, business model. Like, yeah. are people going to have to pay full price getting PVE now with the mm. promise of PVE later when they don't actually know how good that's going to be? That's a problem, um, yeah. This is a far smaller example, but certainly if you remember PvP in Diablo 3. That was something that some people really oh, wanted. Yeah. They communicated about it at the start, and people are just afraid of just being like, where, did, where is it? What's going on? Mm. Uh, obviously, a lot larger here. A lot larger of a responsibility yeah. when it is an entire segment of the game. Now, mm. They sort of explained a bit of how they got here, right? So let, let's dive into this. A few years ago, we made the call to focus our team's development efforts almost entirely in Overwatch 2. As development of the sequel stretched on, it meant that the live game received less focus. It meant we were no longer delivering on one of our core values to support our game by updating it and delivering content on a regular basis. I mean, it's amazing that that focus. was... It's amazing that that was ever one of their core values because they not at one point ever in the game's history were they accurate to that whatsoever. Yeah, they, they've not really done a good job there. And, you know, the thing is, like, a lot of those skins, those are outsourced, yeah. um, which is, you know, normal in the industry. And, like, by all accounts, they do make pretty damn good skins. Yep. That's more just a, a team load thing, right? So the yeah. skins are outsourced. Yeah. And skins aren't content. And, uh, yeah, they're also not content. <laughs> That's pretty big. Um, but I think for what a lot of people like, though, it is the class... It's actual character design and it's map design. Yeah. And I suppose when we think about it, in fairness to Overwatch, does have remarkably tightly designed maps. Yeah. It doesn't feel like, I mean, I know sometimes, you know, you get an, an annual Call of Duty and everyone's just like, oh, great, half the maps are shit. Mm-hmm. Overwatch had great maps. At least from, from my perspective, I could be out of date. I don't know what some of the newer ones were like, but I generally love their maps. And if you think about maps and, and, and heroes... Can't f- you can't just double the map and hero designing team and get double the maps and heroes. No, that's impossible. It just doesn't work like that. So I suppose if they really are committed to like hero reworks, new heroes, lots of new maps, yeah, it is just going to pull away. I, I guess in a context where they are the team building the actual game. And, you know, it's not yeah. an Activision-like situation where there's support studios and stuff like that. Yeah, that's kind of the problem. Because I'm just thinking how you're like, how you, I... I guess how idealistic it is for Overwatch to be this like really tightly designed game with this really, you know, it's only got so many heroes and they all play really well. It's, you know, it's only got so many maps and they're all really good. So you've got theoretically infinite playtime in the way a lot of gamers will be clamoring for in the realm of everything changes every week. Everything's a live service nightmare. The idea of it being like this is, you know, this is just good. I feel like that's something that League can kind of almost get, but even though it changes a lot. I think some of that comes down to they need to just, you know, it's not that they need to suddenly go and make millions of content things. They just need to make any form of content, any form of, here's, here's, you you feel like you're being listened to. You feel like you're getting updates as opposed to nothing for months. And comms are exactly the Blizzard problem. Like we've only just got the community council in World of Warcraft and that's been great talking about like details and things with the game. Yes. But in a more macro sense, Blizzard are completely useless and... There have been times where they've wheeled out pretty senior staff into interviews and stuff like that, mm. or, you know, done promotional videos, and it's just so laced with PR, <laughs> yeah. or in the case of those preach interviews, just so high in their own supply, that, you know, actually they do more damage than good, it would seem. Yeah, which, yeah, which, like, for... Such an out-of-touch company, it's insane. Yeah, and because this is Overwatch, obviously they've got the game director out talking uh, from his heart, and it's, you know, people are lamenting the fact that it's not Jeff, it's not uh, Kaplan, it's Aaron Keller instead, but... You know, as far as as far as uh, I think most uh, kind of community reception was, everyone's like, "You're not Jeff, but we appreciate that. We appreciate that this is like feels candid enough. It feels like he's yeah. he's coming with candor. He's apologizing. He's delivering things with like no PR spin. I mean, there is spin in terms of he's not admitting very specific faults, and you know, it's kind of like he's definitely it's definitely an announcement that is half apology at the same time." But it does still feel real like an apology as opposed yeah. to any time, you know, the Warcraft team talk. Yeah, and like, it's very unfair to be like, yeah, hey, you're not, Jeff. I mean, yeah. that's definitely, you know, very hard shoes to fill. I'm sure of he feels so. that. And I mean, he comes across quite well. Yeah, so, yeah you know, exactly. I yep. think they, the Overwatch community probably should be happy enough with him. And I believe also he like worked very closely with Jeff. Like, oh, yeah. There's a reason why he's the game director now. Yeah, he um, was, he's the the fitting successor. Yeah, though even some of the delay that we've seen, a part of that is like the change in hands. Yeah. Change in team and all that. Um, now for uh, what's actually happening, there's the alpha starting this week, but that's mostly, you know, Blizz staff, partners, so I guess like streamers, that sort of thing. Overwatch League players, mm-hmm. um, 
right? So I, I mean, I feel pretty bad there for the developers and partners who are just <laughs> going to get minced by the league players. <laughs> yeah. um, but then there's a closed beta starting in April with signups being open now, and that yeah. crashed their site, which is always actually a good sign. Especially, especially considering, I mean, obviously they were they were able to just uh, turn the knobs and scale the site up with the Bnet infrastructure, but the fact that you're crashing Bnet infrastructure, like that's that's a lot of interest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, now, there's going to be more betas and stuff like that throughout the year. Mm -hmm. For future communication, then, because I think what people need is some confidence, some faith that this is going to be like a stable situation. They basically just said, starting now, they'll be communicating much more frequently about plans. During and after each beta, they will have updates about what they're learning, changes they're considering, and uh, what they're going to be testing next. Which, I mean, yes, is just how a beta works, mm -hmm. but they just need to keep the promise. They need to actually do it. Absolutely. Over on the Warcraft side, because mm -hmm. we've also, uh, in, in the Warcraft side of things, had our, you know, okay, it didn't come with the, we're sorry for almost purposefully destroying the last 20 years of this franchise's legacy. They didn't do that. I can't really expect them to, <laughs> to just flat out say that, but it's what we're all thinking. Yeah. What they did do, though, is uh, they spelled out a timeline where there's going to be Hearthstone stuff um, in a few days, actually. Mm -hmm. Then the next WoW expansion, April 19th, will be its reveal, and the mobile game announcement will be uh, in May. But, of course, overall narrative-wise, the spin and the feel... Uh, you know, they are continuing to rapidly disengage from the core fan base. They're pretending that all the stuff they're doing is hot shit, that it's awesome, that like, oh my god, we've pulled together all these things from Warcraft 3, which, you know, whenever you say that, it does basically feel borderline offensive to anybody who's actually uh, been invested in this world for a significant period of time. There's a lot of people on Twitter who've been like, oh my god, you can't criticize this work. It was made by people, and people have feelings. Where it's like, okay, yeah, don't be a total thunder cunt about it, but at the mm. end of the day, you got to criticize the work because it is what it is, and they're asking us to pay for it. Yeah, that's why you know when it comes to when it comes to the the wow side of things, fucking no quarter will be given. Yeah, and I mean They've, even they the, don't they they have shown they're not worthy of it. Yeah, even looking at the emotion the like emotional feelings angles, like well, customers have feelings too. Yeah, you can't have a feelings versus feelings fight because no one wins. Yeah, well, then it just comes down to I'm a creator and you're a consumer and I'm more important. Yeah, which is how some of that bullshit, uh, you know, comes off, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, so much of that is just people being able to peacock that they're you know good and have the good boy feelings, of course, which yeah. is basically what Twitter comes down to. Now, for Hearthstone, the other Blizzard property, mm. well, uh, the director is leaving to work on another project at Blizzard. Speculation mm. is that he is joining other ex-Hearthstone devs to work on a card game roguelite like Slay the Spire, though. Yeah, it is. It, Interesting. Yeah, this speculation is very, very loose. It's literally just, well, what would Blizzard do with a bunch of people who understand Hearthstone design? Mm. And that's a fairly, you know, that's the first thing that comes to mind. So it, it could be something completely different, but that's what uh, people are saying. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. He's also said there's a bunch of new and unique card types that are coming into the game that they're basically trying to push out yeah. the boat, mm -hmm. which, you know what? Fair enough. I think if Hearthstone, like it's not going to be magic online or something. Yeah. So if they can just get weird and wacky, then I guess fair enough. Um, now they have said that the game's got a huge player base and makes more money than many AAA games. Hardly a surprise. I mean, you're... You're selling database entries, right? It's a pretty damn yep. good business to be in. Yep. Now, the expansion announcement is Tuesday the 15th. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, you know, they're... Look, Hearthstone, they've got... As much as I cannot... I cannot fathom putting money into regular card packs yeah. because of the game's business model. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of new card sets that come out. Lots of new mm -hmm. content. Book of Mercenaries is great. Anytime they do a single-player experiment, it's great. Battlegrounds is really fun. And as much as the monetization angle of it feels pretty, you know, ugh, that other new mode that they, you know, put out is probably decent enough fun too. Like, they yeah. continually do make lots of really good fun game. Yeah, it's really frustrating as a, you know, from, I guess for anyone who's ever been a Blizzard fan, you look at the games, you're like, the fundamentals of these are actually so good. So good. Yeah. Like, Hearthstone is has a whole bunch of problems, but it's just, they can pump content and it's always at least a little bit fun. Maybe it's not fun for, like, the super hyper-engaged because of, like, balance issues and how hard that is to actually run. It's why, you know, Magic's basically, you know, so perfect all the time or f always comes across as perfect all the time. It's like, it, it's basically a miracle. Magic itself is magic uh, in terms of balance. But, um, like, Warcraft, the RTS stuff was always perfect. Starcraft, always perfect. Mm. Uh, Here's the Storm was just... Obviously, missteps, but really, really good. A oh, beautiful oh, game, yeah. so oh, much fun. Yeah. Overwatch as a uh, like as a hero shooter was really, really good. As like, 
you can make the core game really well, but of basically every game so far, outside of like some of the best times in World of Warcraft's history, Blizzard have never been able to go, we have, you know, we've started this uh, path, we need to stick to it super hard. They, yeah. they can nail the, the opening shot, but that's about it. They've always struggled with follow through. Yeah. And it's the weird thing because whenever they follow through with a sequel, mm -hmm. say StarCraft 2. Yeah. Okay, well, Diablo 3 is a bit of a tricky one to talk about. Because it's like the core game of Diablo is great. It's just 3 had so many, you know, yeah. stupid things. But, like, generally, they have done a good job there. But it's been the sticking to it. It's been, funny enough, the exploitation of their IP that they've always... They've been great at creating the IP and it doing really well. And it made a stupid amount of money with Warcraft back in the day. But, like... Is Warcraft maximally exploited as an IP in a way that will deliver maximum shareholder value and also consumer satisfaction? No, no, because no. Where's the you know where where's the animated show? Where's the spin-off games? Like think yeah. about what they do with Final Fantasy. I was just about to say that the <laughs> like especially because I was look, looking at the, the state of play from uh, like uh, this week from Sony was just well it was, it was just hey Square Enix have you got any games or like <laughs> yes. Here's our franchises here. Our games are just going to fire them at you until you are literally sick of RPGs. That's like, why can Blizzard not do that with their IP? Obviously, they're smaller than Nexus Square Enix, but like, I actually think a lot of it could be that. Smaller? Yeah, like, I've, yeah. I've there's times I've heard that the Warcraft team is smaller than people would think, which, mm. I mean, certainly wouldn't be surprising when you look at the output. But I also heard that whenever they tried to expand the team, like was it like a fifty percent increase? Somewhere, Can't remember yeah. if it was doubling the team or it was a fifty percent increase. Whatever it was near the end of MOP, that apparently like was really hard, really hard on production. Um, and we know they've also had retention issues, yeah, as well. It seems over the last while. So I feel like they haven't been able to scale up their teams and their workflows. Mm. Um, and it's it's weird because there's there's lots of different models for for doing this. I remember at one point in Bungie, it was like they had a, a sort of a live game team, yeah. and then the you know the people making the new Destiny game, hmm. which of course led to the issue of the people making the new Destiny didn't learn the lessons the live team learned. Very strange to happen in an organization. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's the Activision model of having mm -hmm. all of the support studios, yeah. but Blizzard hasn't really had that. They seem to have just had you know this is Team Two, this is what they're doing, that's that, yep. and it's like there's only so much Team Two can do. Yeah, well, Whereas this is perhaps some of the demands of modern gaming are are really, they're really basically saying like, hey, the era of just kind of being, you know, cool, chill dude, Mike Morheim, those don't work. Maybe now the, given everything else going on in the market, like what you actually have to do is aggressively expand and make the big bets, make the big moves. Yeah, well, um, um, I wonder. If, yeah, if you're trying to operate a really big gaming business, then aggressively exp expanding is, you know, obviously the play. But I think it's something a little bit more fundamental. I think the thing that um, Blizzard have never seemingly ever been able to manage their teams or manage anything. They can make good games, but people who make good games aren't people who make good uh, game managers. They're not people who can manage organized teams and think from like the business angle. Mick Gordon makes some of the most incredible fucking metal you're going to yeah. get in a video game. Yet it seemed there was, you know, timeline and project management issues. Yeah. Really a musician, but sometimes the role of a musician also involves managing the project and delivering it on time. Yeah, it's a case of like, there's so there's so much of like, especially AAA gaming's major missteps. You know, you look at like the philosophical missteps of we're going to go heavy on monetization and we're going to screw over the customer with all of these, you know, make the money now things. And that's like, that's not mismanagement. That's just evil evil corporate douchebags making decisions. Yeah. But in terms of games coming out and they're not done, games coming out and the design choices are a bit odd or a game takes three times as long as it you know should have to make, that's mismanagement. I think that's the story of there's certain, you know, there's certain game companies, and Square Enix is a good publisher in this case, where you, you'll you see them solve mismanagement issues and start to organize how to organize teams, how to organize developers, and they will just be like, we've, you know, Big, it's almost, uh, I used an example a while ago, which is, you know, uh, in terms of writing, you know, it's pretty easy to have a good writer write really fast, mm. but it's all the managing around that and getting them the space to actually manage or actually write. It's the same for game devs, I think, where it's because if you need to have everyone optimally, con in, the, in the optimal condition to start running and making, if you can't have that, then they can't do anything. So it's like unlocking all of that creative potential and development potential is what's going to be the, the differing factor for uh, publishers in the uh, in the 
I guess in the near future. Yeah. And like Square Enix is like their B teams and they're kind of here's a load of veteran people, here's some new hires, go make shit. Just seems to work. Not to extreme effect, but it works. I think to an issue, I'll probably try to wrap it up, but like yeah. if I can sort of compare things, you know, it plays like the way it used to be is hey, we've got so much money. <laughs> yeah. We have freedom to do whatever the fuck we want. We'll just take our time. Mm -hmm. And like that can be really good, yeah. And there's a way where we can all idealize that. There's also something to be said for, here's your budget. The game has got to be done by then. I mean, like, yeah. that, that actually even forces creativity sometimes. You know, the whole thing where if you just set somebody down with a blank sheet of paper and just tell them, you know, go, go write a story. They'll be like, oh, what? But if you give somebody bounds, you know, constraints, they'll be better able to actually sort of express themselves through that. Very often yeah. that is the case. So it's like our thing. You know, we have the, the development budget for Pale Beyond. Mm -hmm. Once that runs out, that's it. It's not there anymore. <laughs> So we're like, okay, we have to finish the game by this date. We spend this much money uh, a month on staff, and that's what it is. And that yeah. forces you to have a game at the end yeah, well, that I mean, can go out to people. Yeah, was it the same? Necessity is a mother of invention. Yeah. That's that's where, you know, not obviously invention in this case. You haven't invented good managing practices. But in the cases, you can invent good managing practices. And I'm sure that's what a lot of uh, companies are like. We see, you know, we can see the end of the train tracks we need to learn how to build these train tracks really, really fast. Yeah. There's times when, like, whenever we were just kind of, you know, there was no publishing deal. Yeah. We were just, you know, time was just this thing that could expand if needed. Well, what would happen is we'd end up over-designing things. Yeah. And there's times where, like, because of what can we actually make within this, you know, the runway of this budget, we'd be like, okay, well, we're just going to cut that and do it differently. And we ended up doing something more simple that actually is way better, results in a way better player experience because yep. turns out something that's over-designed is over-designed. It doesn't feel bad and yeah. confuses people and is just shitty. It's made for the designer, not for the player. And is that not a a very big and interesting topic within game development? <laughs> yep. Definitely for another video. Hello, Elden Ring. <laughs> ah, dear. So that's it for us. Uh, that's what's going on with Blizzard. I think... Um, you know, we'll, we'll get updates for World of Warcraft soon enough. I'm very interested to share those with you as well as our analysis on whether the next expansion uh, is is able to turn things around. I think in this case, yeah. there is no break glass in case of emergency. Mm -hmm. I think there is no sudden turnaround to the game we all want. No. I think there is a course correction that at least makes us think we're pointed in the right direction. But that certainly is not ideal. Yeah, that's yeah. Basically, Here. basically, Blizzard need to start making the right decisions before they can get the right direction. Yeah, yeah. I want to see a Blizzard that doesn't do that to Kalthazad. Yeah, frankly. And, and to be fair to them, having Ann Keller go, "Hey, we're going to make the decision to get you to allow you to play Overwatch now." I think that's probably one of the good ones. At least they're thinking about the player. Yep, and if this goes well, then hopefully more learnings come from it. All right, indeed. Yeah. That's from us. See you next time.